Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to the Age of Understanding, translating training into profit. My name is Robert Gorby. I'm the VP for Language Solutions in SDL, and I'm delighted to be joined by Jeff Shepstone from Desire to Learn. Hello. Hello, Jeff. Comment ça va? Ça va bien. Et vous, hein? Bon, écoute, moi, j'ai du mal le matin. Avant de commencer, je dois boire le café. Donc, ah déjà, bon. j'en ai eu deux, et tant mieux, il y a une crosse à pas loin d'ici. Ah bon, moi, moi aussi, j'ai déjà eu deux. Mais là, je ne sais pas s'ils si ont eu un café ici, donc... Euh, ce qu'on va faire, on va offrir un café gratuit aux premières trois personnes qui se mettent debout et disent café. Qui veut un café Il faut se mettre debout et dire café. Levez-vous. Levez-vous. Ah. Voilà. Ah, bon. One. Two. Oh, OK. One ah. more. OK. Done. I guess the point there being that I imagine quite a few people are going to be offering their e-learning content and programs in English. And that was just a little bit of a taster to what it feels like for some of your international colleagues who may be trying to learn things in a foreign language. They might get the general gist of things, they might get the general understanding, but they won't fully understand it, and therefore they could miss out on an opportunity. In this case, it was a coffee, but in other cases, it could be something else. So I think the point being, it's really important to make sure that you're offering local language learning and really delivering that understanding in a local language. Just in terms of the, the, the three points up here that you can see, agility, collaboration, and compliance. I guarantee you, no matter what you're working on, whether it's an e-learning platform, whether it's a training program, whether it's a corporate change program that you're working on, one of those three will be part of the goals, that list of goals that you have for your project. Those three things are absolutely crucial to sustainable, profitable growth for any business. But trying to deliver agility or collaboration internationally in a foreign language is not possible. You have to make sure that it relies on those two things of understanding and also speed. So two things are really key here. One, making sure people understand things fully, as you saw from that little skit around the coffee. But secondly, they need to understand that speed. There's no point in people half-heartedly getting things or just generally understanding it, but not quite, or fully understanding it, but weeks and months after everybody else. So when you are considering international e-learning content and programs, do consider the fact that you need to deliver understanding at speed on a global level. The challenge, of course, is that you've got so many different channels to deliver content across and it's evolving all the time. And you can see around this event today how many new channels there are to e-learning. And trying to deliver understanding at speed across all of those channels is a real challenge in one language. So imagine trying to do it in 5, 10, 20 languages, depending on what countries your company covers. So you really need to find solutions that enable you to deliver that in a local language. Most people will say, look, our corporate language is English. And I'm assuming around here, many businesses will have a corporate language of English and assume, look, that's going to be fine. People will get it. It'll be OK. And they'll go with that. What can go wrong? Jeff, what could go wrong with just putting English out there and? Yeah, I'm sure it's probably fine. Oh, fine. Yeah. I reckon. Well, it ain't. And I'm sure you know that. But it's not just the big obvious things that can go wrong when you just rely on, on English only. And, and here's one example. I think in, in Qatar, the, the supervisor in this particular plant believed he fully understood his American supervisor when he said, make sure the tankers are fully labeled no smoking in Arabic and diesel fuel in Arabic. It's pretty clear, pretty easy to understand. But actually, something that seems fairly simple goes wrong. Now, if you imagine that situation happening in your own businesses in a different type of environment, that can lead to you know, different types of consequences. I think in this case, it just drew a few laughs. But I think in other cases, that can be a bit more serious. So. I'm sure you all heard about the, the two UK airports that were shut down last year because of IT issues when IT services were outsourced uh, abroad. We also heard about a hotel chain that had some issues with training in the UK on serving children uh, underage drink because the staff hadn't been trained. The staff uh, weren't native English speakers. So it's again always important not to assume people can understand in English. One thing a lot of people will do is they will make an assumption saying, look, what I'll do is I'll just use one of these free machine translation portals, and I'll run everything through a Google Translate or a, a Bing Translate, or I will leave it to my 
colleagues to do that. So we just put it out there in English and let everybody else work themselves out. The issue with that is if you read the user agreements on a lot of these free public portals for machine translation, and you read their user agreements where they can do what they like pretty much with your content, and you consider that a lot of e-learning content is very corporate sensitive, contains corporate sensitive information, there's no wonder that two-thirds of corporations are really concerned about sensitive data being leaked through the translation process. So very important that you find a provider who can provide secure machine and human translation solutions. I'm sure you're all aware of the GDPR deadline coming up, and everybody's fully up to speed on GDPR, right? Again, another consideration of, you know, that's something, considering the fines and the potential risks involved, that's not something that you want to really skimp in terms of translations to save a few pounds here and there just not to translate something. It's important you make sure people are up to speed fully. Final piece from me before I hand over to Jeff is just to share some insights. We interviewed 2,000 people in Germany, and we asked them for their perception of receiving e-learning content and training material in a non-native language. And the issue that they all said is over two-thirds of them each said that it actually had a negative impact on their performance. So not only they said, look, it's more difficult to understand, which is fairly obvious, they also said, actually, it has a negative impact on performance. So there is real kind of evidence here to suggest that the investment in local language learning will pay off and translate into profitability. So with that, I'm going to hand over to, to Jeff. Um, my final sign off really is, you know, it's not about just translation, but it's about enabling your business and your colleagues to be that critical bit better than the competition. How do you enable them to be that critical bit better? And enabling local language learning is one way to do that. So I'm going to hand over to Jeff now, who's going to share his top tips on how to deliver understanding at speed globally. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining the session today. Thanks, Rob. All right. So um, here we go. So um, D2L, if you're not familiar with us, we're a software company. We provide an online learning platform. We also create e-learning content for our customers. Um, we translate our product to 15 languages, and um, today I just want to share some practical tips with you in our short time um, to both uh, guide you for e-learning content development and some software tips as well if you're on that side of the business. Um, just for some background about D2L, um, we used to deliver software in the waterfall methodology, and we switched to Agile recently because that is the thing that people are doing these days. Um, it's great. I think it's fantastic, but it has... Uh, uh, causes some uh, difficulties for translation. Um, when we're releasing every month, we have four weeks to build something and two weeks to QA. That doesn't leave a lot of time for translation and, and thinking about those kind of things. So we're delivering at speed, and uh, I'll give you some tips that help us um, do things at speed. So um, here we go. So first, let's talk about language. So um, we're talking about the text that we're providing to our users or our learners. Um, here's an example from, this is my, the kind of the gold star example of localization, Pixar. Um, in their, uh, the film uh, Monsters University, they had a, a scene here where there was a message spelled out on cupcakes. And the idea is uh, the, the creator of the cupcakes has the, them flipped and they land on their face and it spells out lame or something like that. So that's a, that's a difficult situation to localize. Um, so what Pixar did instead is instead of trying to find a, what is it, a seven letter word that would explain friendship or a friendly greeting and then sort of an unfortunate outcome in four letters that also fits the, the context, um, they just use smileys and uh, those were unhappy smileys after. So Pixar is a really great example of really thoughtful localization. I don't know if you've looked into it. Um, not many people who speak multiple languages rewatch the same um, animated movie and think about these tiny details like, uh, oh, uh, the, the undesirable vegetable in this uh, scene was broccoli, but when I watched it in Japanese, it was a different vegetable, like things that we don't think about. So that's what localization is, is making your content seem natural or native to native speakers. So, um, so talking about language, um, there are tons of resources related to global English. Um, it's essentially just a, a simple way to write in English that is um, easy to understand for non-native speakers, and it's really handy for translators, too. So um, 
I, I found this blog post by uh, Marcia Johnson at the Content Wrangler. It's more of a blog for um, technical writers, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of these resources can be super technical about you know clause formation and, and uh, all these very technical linguistic things. Um, but this uh, blog post, if you want to go search for it, the Content Wrangler later with Global English as a keyword, you'll find it. But the, the tips that I picked out of it that I wanted to share with you today are... Um, Keep your sentences under 30 words. Um, you can't get into sticky situations with complicated or ambiguous uh, phrasing that way. Um, determiners like the, uh, those kind of things. Um, great for headlines and poetry if you want to be poetic and uh, uh, maybe have uh, some fun with wording there. It's not really great for translation because um, it adds ambiguity. Um, and the translators have to guess at what you're talking about, which is not good. So. Um, stick to clear messaging like that. In English, we like to use passive voice a lot. Also not great for translation because uh, passive voice essentially uh, is uh, an ambiguity of the, the, the agent of something. So um, when a translator might need to convert that into a different structure in another language and they need to do, know who or how something's happening, they have to guess and that's not great. So that's where these, these tiny little nuances that lead to misunderstanding and in translation. So um, the, the other one here that I've tried to adhere to in my presentation is uh, avoid incomplete sentences and bullet points. Um, again, another uh, leaving things to ambiguity or suggestion, not super helpful when, uh, when you need to be clear on the, the concept that's behind uh, uh, what you're saying. So um, moving along, design. So we've talked about the, the text, the content of what you're trying to convey. Design is the method that you provide it. And so it could be simple text, or maybe you're developing software, or a, you know a rich learning experience. Um, so this is the method and how it's presented. So um, here, the, here's a simple example of some instructional text. Uh, select next to continue, and there at the bottom right, you see next in a in a box. Great, pretty obvious what we're supposed to do here. So click next. In German, you see that the instructional text is about 20, 30 percent larger. That's okay. It works in our uh, instructional area. The next button works as well in German. Let's have a look at Spanish. Not much longer than English, but oh, if you look at the bottom right there, the, uh, the next button text is uh, expanded beyond the actual size of the box. So um, it's um, basically, here, uh, let's go to the next one. The, another solution that we could look at here is not even using text at all, I'm using an arrow, that's the design sort of uh, view on this. You don't necessarily have to rely on text for these things. Um, but that said, you also need to consider your target audience. Um, so if you were developing this for European languages, probably not a big deal. This would actually be really great because you would save on translation costs. You don't have to translate those words. Um, it's pretty obvious. You don't have to worry about redesigning things. However, if you're targeting a right to left language or locale, this is going to be the opposite of what you want to say. This is going to say back instead of next, because the right to left uh, um, directionality there. So um, essentially, the, the point of design is you need to know who your audience is and uh, be knowledgeable about their needs for design that way. Um, here's an example of maybe over-engineering the uh, uh, instructional text. Sometimes you don't need to have that. Um, so. Uh, moving right along, so essentially you want to be mindful of your design and uh, reach out to experts um, for the target languages that you're working with. Um, so we talk about best, best practices all day, but I want to offer you some tips that you can take away. Um, it, whether you're working in e-learning de content development or instructional design or software development, that kind of stuff. So um, for e-learning materials, um, uh, knowing your non-English audience carried over from the last slide, um, you do need to know the kinds of things that they will, mm, the, the processes that they will understand again with the left to right situation. Um, this is the key one. You want to make your design simple and adaptable. So uh, in ideal situation, you have lots of time to plan in advance what your content's going to look like and be able to adapt it and that kind of thing. So. Um, if you're starting from the beginning, it's great if you can um, 
make it adaptable, design it to be, you know, switch things out. In the example of the, the arrow, if that hadn't been considered and that was hard coded into the next button, you would want to redesign that so it can be swapped out with a different element without a lot of engineering effort, that kind of thing. Um, and the last one is actually a pretty standard uh, step for translating content is to have a glossary of special terminology that uh, you'll be using. So um, uh, an example of software, I talked about agile methodology. If we're creating some e-learning content about agile, we would probably want to uh, explain that we're, we're talking about this special terminology. But the point here I'm trying to convey is if you do that from the beginning as a content developer, so you're developing a course about agile terminology, if you create this as you're writing or in advance, um, it helps you be consistent with your terminology as you go through. Maybe you wanted to use a synonym in another area or something like that. It keeps using the same stuff. Um, your translators already have it when you're done. And it's easier for your learners to understand because um, it keeps you as the content creator mindful of um, being simple, concise, to the point um, with your terminology as well. Um, here we go. Um, so on the software side of things, um, I don't know if any of you here are interested in that, but uh, the one point that I want to convey is concatenation is the worst. Concatenation is stringing multiple elements together to create one meaningful idea in the end. So here's an example of something that we worked with with our engineers at D2L. Um, they are, engineers are great. They're very efficient. They're always thinking about saving costs and making things faster for us. But um, in this case, they thought, you know what? We use the, the phrase new a lot. You know, we want to create a new user, or a new discussion, or a, you know, a new, new something else. So why don't we just create a, a text element for new, and we can reuse that for all these other things, which is the opposite of what is good uh, when it comes to translating things, because the translators don't know that new, they, they will see the text new and translate that on its own, sort of um, separate from the context of the, the rest of the things that the engineers have put it together with. So um, in this example in French, yes, uh, um, in the first line you see new discussion. That's great for English speakers. Um, and then in French, the syntax works in this specific case, but the gender agreement doesn't work, so nouvelle. Masculine there doesn't work with discussion, which is feminine. Um, even in a different example in French with a different adjective, like uh, blue or something like that, discussion bleu, like that doesn't make sense. But um, the translators wouldn't have control over the context or the syntax of those words. So it would come out as like bleu discussion, which doesn't make any sense. The syntax is incorrect in French. So the best way to do it is keep your meaningful segments together. So um, if you're trying to convey a message in your software, whether it's a long piece of text or a simple header or something like that, don't split it up into different parts. Um, that's the, the takeaway there. The other one is if you're developing software, you probably want to be commenting your code anyway. This applies to your uh, resource files. So the, the, if you're keeping your language resources somewhere, you also want to include some uh, descriptions about how it is. Imagine you have like a very curious four-year-old on the phone who's going to ask you a lot of questions about something. They want to know why, 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 why. If you can in advance anticipate those questions and say, you know what, this is an item in a list, or this is the header of something, or um, this is going to be used in this text color or something like that. These are all things that translators would need to know to help localize your text or product uh, effectively for your target audiences. So. Um, Moving along to process, um, I'm going to give you guys a case study from one of our products at D2L. Um, so in this example, um, essentially what I'm trying to convey is that automation is great, but we still need to have some creativity involved. Um, our engineers can be creative, but uh, we, we do need to be open to other approaches to translating our content. So, um, so our, we developed a feature. It's an image catalog that uh, automatically recommends imagery for, uh, for a course. So you can spin up a course really quickly. You give it the name of the course, that kind of stuff, and it will find images that are related to the subject matter of your course. So um, the, the difficulty here is that the tags that are associated with those images are in English, and they're just one word, and they don't really have any context on their own. So if we were submitting uh, things to our translators to process, 
typically we'd send a, a list of terms to be translated, and in this case, that won't work because they they lack context essentially. So um, here's a, a preview of what a, what the feature looks like. So physics in this example, the the logic behind the the feature has found some waves, and that's uh, representative of. Um, of physics, and when you go into that course, that image will be used, and other related images will be used to um, make your course look nice and fancy without having to put a lot of design effort into it. Um, so, um, here's an example of one of the tags that was used at growth. It's a noun. It can be used in the context of business. You see, you know, a chart with things trending up, or maybe in biology with. Um, uh, plants growing or something like that. I mean, it could also be used in a medical context. That's probably not the one we're going for. So we want to be really clear with our translators to this. So how do we do this? We have a list of tags, and we have some images. Um, it's not, the traditional method is not going to work. So what we did is we created a user interface for the translators to, like a portal for them to log into. Um, and they could view the images. They could view the English tags that were already associated with them. And they would creatively develop their own tags for these images. So um, this is the, the human element that we would not get with a machine translation or a typical translation process. So um, here I'll show you what that looked like. So here are some of the English tags that we had. So I want you to imagine what kind of image would come to mind with these tags. So we have wire, fence, growth, web, park. Do you have any, uh, you know, if you have an image in your head, I'll show you the image next. It's probably not exactly the same thing, and that's the point here. So we can kind of see how these tags were uh, assigned to this image. So now I'll show you the uh, Spanish and French uh, translations, the, the work that the translators did to create these tags. So we have Spanish and French. Um, the Spanish translations were a lot more... Um, uh, I don't want to say literal, it was a more material approach, and the, trans uh, the translators for French were a little more creative and abstract. So um, these things still apply, they still describe the image, but um, if we literally translated or traditionally translated the tags in English, it would not be very successful. Um, we would not be giving our users the, the feature that we want. So um, there's a case study in thoughtful localization and thinking outside of the usual process. So, all right. Rob, I think I'm handing it over to you. Excellent, OK. Thanks, Jeff, if you want Thank to you. click on a bit. Um, thanks for that, Jeff. I appreciate it. I think that's actually really practical insights from Jeff in terms of what you can take away and, and apply, whether it's training content or, or platforms. And I guess the final takeaway for us is really consider this idea of delivering understanding at speed. That's ultimately what you're trying to do. So don't just think of the, the, the projects or the content. It's, it's actually, am I delivering understanding at speed? And am I doing that in a local language, uh, taking on board the, the tips from Jeff? And, and if you do that, I think that's how you can deliver profitable returns on the investment in translation. A lot of people see translation potentially as an unnecessary cost. But actually, what it can really do in the context of delivering understanding at speed is to deliver that profitability. So thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. What I'd like to say is if you do have time to pop over to our stand just right beside us here at SDL, we've got, the, um, we've got a, uh, a cost savings calculator that we can run through with you to show the potential cost savings and potential profitability that you can uh, deliver through translation process. So worth spending a few minutes with us after the, uh, after the talk. So thank you very much for your time.